great detectives of old time radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I want to encourage you as you're making your holiday travel plans, remember uh, johnnydollarair.com. It's a Priceline affiliate, so you get all the benefits of Priceline in terms of being able to uh, name your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, uh, even more. Uh, or you can choose from several great published fares. Plus, a portion of your purchase goes to support the great detectives of old-time radio at no additional cost to you. So for all of your travel needs, remember johnnydollarair.com. Well, we're going to go back to November of 1956. There was an episode I skipped uh, because it aired around Thanksgiving. Most of the episode has nothing to do with Thanksgiving. But there's a great uh, Thanksgiving message that I thought appropriate to play this time of year in Johnny's uh, post-episode remarks prior to giving details on next week's show. So this program is from November 18th, 1956, and the title is The Mark of Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Stellar. This is Ed Porter, Mr. Dollar. You called my office? Yes, I'd like to see you as soon as I can, Mr. Porter. Well, of course. How long have you been in town? About a half an hour. Are you all squared away? I've got a room and I've had a bath, if that's what you mean. Well, then I guess you're ready to go to work. I will be as soon as I put on some pants. You sound in a rush. I'm always in a rush when I think somebody might be chipping us out of (laughs) $100,000. Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Life and Trust Company, 826 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Markham matter. Expense account item one, $143.69, air transportation from Hartford to San Francisco. Item two, $17 for incidentals along the way, including transportation from the airport to the St. Francis Hotel. I walked the eight blocks to the Commodore building where Ed Porter had his office on the fourth floor. He was a short, thin insurance broker with a face like a tight drum. He apologized for the clammy weather as though it were his fault. He asked me how things were out on the East Coast and invited me to sit down and looked as uncomfortable as he was. I uh, got the telegram you were coming last night. Investigator, I've never met one in all my years in the business. Must be very interesting work. Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Mr. Porter, but I would like to get some information from you. Oh, certainly, Mr. Dollar. What can you tell me about a man named Floyd Markham? Markham? Well, he's the husband of a client of mine. I've met him, but I really can't tell you too much about him. My dealings have always been with Mrs. Markham. She's my customer. Then tell me about Mrs. Markham. Oh, certainly. I, uh, I'm not going to ask why. I'm sure you have a good reason for coming all the way to San Francisco. The home office thinks I have an excellent reason. Uh, Yes. Uh, Mrs. Markham. Well, uh, I've known her for 20 years as a customer. She's wealthy, always has been, and she handles her money well, and she lives rather well. Mrs. Markham's the one who has the money, huh? Uh, Mr. Markham is a salaried man, an industrial engineer. Frankly, I think he depends on Mrs. Markham for his livelihood. Oh, yeah. These two checks were issued to Mrs. Markham this year. Recognize them? Mm, Yes, yes. Uh, Full payments on two endowment policies, $50,000 apiece. And they've cleared the bank. Anything wrong with them? Nothing wrong with the checks. On payoffs like this, I always take it in person. It's a custom, of course, to call and make an appointment and deliver the check to the client. Mm -hmm. And try to sell a little more insurance in the bargain. Well, that's about the idea, yes. Anything strange about Mrs. Markham when you delivered either one of these checks? No. Before I left Hartford, I looked up her insurance records. Her premiums are always paid right on the button. 
Mrs. Markham doesn't have a business office or a business manager handling her affairs. The checks are always personal checks on her personal account. Now, can you explain why someone like that might forget a third endowment policy? Why, no. Well, there is a third endowment policy. It matured this month. I have the check with me for $50,000. Well, yes, but this business of forgetting... Floyd Markham called Hartford and spoke to the head of the endowment division. He explained that Mrs. Markham was ill and didn't know whether or not a third policy existed. He said he was checking for her. Uh Uh-huh. Now, you say you've known Mrs. Markham over a period of 20 years. Well, is she the kind of person who'd forget $50,000? No one forgets $50,000. Did you notice that both of those checks were deposited in the Markham's joint account? No. Hmm. So they were. Maybe Mrs. Markham's feeling generous these days. Why do you say that? Well, they have a rather strange relationship as far as I've been able to perceive. I mean, what money he makes is his and what she has is hers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I always like to get out of that house because they never seem to me to be a very close couple in in any way. But this seems to make sense now. How's that, Mr. Porter? Well, now, I called up and made an appointment to deliver both of these checks. The first time I went over, Mrs. Markham was ill. And the second time, she had just stepped out for a few minutes. Well, who accepted the checks? Mr. Markham. Both times? Yes. As a matter of fact, now that I think of it, he made the appointment on the phone both times. When was the last time you saw Mrs. Markham? Last spring. A check with the bank revealed that Mrs. Markham had not personally made a deposit since June the 18th. The deposit slips were initialed by Floyd Markham. The checks were endorsed by Leslie Markham. There had been no unusual withdrawals. Expense account item three thirty dollars stenographic and notary services for the attached statements. Mrs. Markham has been having her hair done here for nearly ten years now. Once a week, every Thursday morning. Then she just stopped. I called her home and Mr. Markham informed me that she was away on an extended trip. Mr. Markham called us, uh, it was last June, and informed us that Mrs. Markham was resigning her membership in the bridge club. I telephoned the house twice to see what was the matter. Mr. Markham answered both times and said Mrs. Markham was out. Well, she used to come in here two or three times a month. Made us go over the car from top to bottom. She hasn't been around now for seven or eight months. I don't know who's taking care of the car. Expense account item 430 cents, three phone calls to the Markham residence. I didn't state any particular business. I simply asked to speak to Mrs. Markham. Each time I called, a male voice answered. Each time, the male voice told me Mrs. Markham was out, she was ill, and she was away on a short trip. Industrial Management Limited, Floyd B. Markham President, has a three-room office suite near the Embarcadero. Ten years ago, it had been sensationally new and glassy. When I got there, the carpet was a little too thin and the varnish a little too thin, too. The whole place smelled faintly of mildew. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Markham, please. Do you have an appointment? No, no, not exactly. My name is Harris. I'm with the Cleveland Pump Company. Pump Company? Yes, we're setting in 38 of our installations at the new plant in Valparaiso. Didn't you get my letter? Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid... May I ask your name again? Harris, Stephen B. Harris, Cleveland Pump Company. Oh, yes. Well, Mr. Harris, I'm afraid Mr. Markham never received your letter. When did you mail it? Uh, Thirty days ago. Maybe it was two weeks. Well, tell Mr. Markham I'm here and I'll... I'm sorry, Mr. Harris. Mr. Markham isn't in the office just now. Oh. Well, I'll wait. Uh, well... Well? Uh, he won't be in today... As a matter of fact, he won't be in the rest of the week. Where can I call him? Well, I'm afraid that's impossible. Can't I call him at home? No. Now, look, is he in business or isn't he? Mr. Harris, Mr. Markham hasn't been in the office for six months or more. He's he's tied up on a rather long-range project. What's your name? I'm Miss Beidler. Why didn't you say that in the first place, Miss Beidler? Well, Who else can I talk to here? No one, I'm afraid. You mean that's all there is in this office? Just you and him? When he feels like coming in? I'll tell Mr. Markham you were here. The Markham house was on Fiera Della Street, about six blocks from the Fairmont Hotel. Stone walls, iron grillwork, tangling ivy. 
An old house that had been built by rich people for rich people to live in. The kind of shabby-looking place that only New Yorkers and San Franciscans can get by with and still be called wealthy. I used Ed Porter's car with the Western Life and Trust Company emblem on the door, parked it in the driveway as close as I could to the entrance. It was exactly one o'clock when the door opened. He was tall and pretty, with black hair and broad shoulders. Yes? What is it? I'd like to see Mrs. Markham, please. I'm Mr. Markham. Can I help you? My name's Dollar. I'm with Western Life and Trust Company. Mr. Porter called you? No, he didn't. Oh, well, I must have slipped his mind. He said he was going to call. What's it about? I brought a check from Mrs. Markham on her third endowment policy. Oh. Well, I'll give it to her. She isn't in right now. Well, I'm supposed to deliver it to her. I'll come back another time when she's in. No, you can give it to me. I'll see that she gets it. I'm sorry, Mr. Markham, but I have Look, to Look, I it. know you want to give her the check and try to sell her some more insurance. She's just not in the market. And you can save your little spiel where it'll do some good. Oh, you misunderstand me, Mr. Markham. I have to deliver this to her in person. What's your name again? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Come in. I'll wait till she comes back and make an appointment. Mr. Porter told me he'd made it for three today, She's so... here, she's here. Just come in. Why the runaround? Mrs. Markham is desperately ill. I don't want to disturb her with things like, like this. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. What's the trouble? Very serious anemia. So if, uh, if you'll just give me the I have check, a report I... to make out when I deliver this. I just Only told... take a minute to hand her the check... Then it'll be off my mind and off your mind. Now, look here, Mr... Didn't you call the company's home office about this check? I I called because Mrs. Markham requested me to call. Oh, yes. Just uh, wait here. In the little swirl of his exit, I smelled shaving lotion and guessed at the brand name. I also guessed that his suit cost $300, even if I didn't know what San Francisco tailor had made it. The shirt, the tie, the shoes were expensive, too. Yeah. Mr. Floyd Markham liked expensive things. I wondered if he dyed his hair to keep it all black. I wondered if he was 45 or 50. I also wondered why in a house of that size on that kind of street a servant hadn't answered the door. This way, Mr. Dollar. He led me up a flight of stairs and finally into a high-ceiling room with a fireplace at one end. A gray-haired woman with a sharp, angular face was seated near the window looking out over the city and the bay. She didn't turn her head when we came into the room, but I could see that her eyes were watery and slightly glazed. Please, don't take too long and don't upset her. Leslie. Leslie, dear. Yes, Floyd? This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. He has something for you. Be a good girl, Leslie. Speak to Mr. Dollar. How do you do? And and ask him... Yes. How is Mr. Porter? Oh, he's uh, fine, Mrs. Markham, fine. He'll be sorry to hear that you've been ill. I really would rather that you didn't tell Mr. Porter. Oh. I'm satisfied to make my own slow recovery and not worry any of my friends. We'd like to... Some sherry, Floyd. Now you know what the doctor said, Leslie. Mr. Dollar, you'd like some sherry, wouldn't you? Why, yes, I'd like that very much. Floyd? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. It's absolutely forbidden. And you know that, dear. Uh, do you have the check, Mr. Dollar? <sighs> yes, right here. Here you are, Mrs. Markham. Thank you. Is there anything else, Mr. Dollar? Well, uh... Mr. Dollar, I... Now, Leslie... Yes? What is it, Mrs. Markham? I'm very tired. Excuse me if I seem impolite. Good day. Good day, Mrs. Markham. Expense account item 5, 10 cents. Phone call to Ed Porter at his office. Yes, Mr. Dollar? Look, Mrs. Markham's 5'5", five, five, about 120, black hair, gray streak to the right of the part, blue eyes, looks about 40 years old, a good 40. Why, yes, that sounds like her. You mean you've seen her? I've seen what's left of her, Mr. Porter. Oh, good Lord, she's not dead. Almost. What? He's killing her, Mr. Porter. My guess is he's been at it for about six months. <laughs> Ah. Uh-huh. 
Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Nobody will take a frown at face value anymore now that the word has gotten around about Jack Benny's return to the air. With Mary Livingston, Dennis Day, Rochester, Don Wilson, Mel Blank, Frank Nelson, and Mr. Kitzel, nothing less than your very best smile will do for the occasion. Tonight, and every Sunday night, hear CBS Radio's Jack Benny Show and give your sense of humor a real workout. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Markham Matter. Take a rich old house on a rich old street in San Francisco. Walk in with a legitimate insurance check for $50,000 and tell a man named Floyd Markham you want to deliver it to his wife. Tell him this when you know that no one has seen or heard from his wife in six months. Just tell him you want to see her. Insist that you see her. Then stand around and listen to him lie a couple of times. Then let him take you to her. Give her the check. Say goodbye. Twenty minutes after I walked out of the Markham's house and picked up Ed Porter, we drove back to the house and parked a hundred feet from the entrance. This is the darndest thing I ever heard of, Mr. Dollar. I'm not sure it's all clear to me. What's our position? Oh, I wouldn't know that, Mr. Porter. That's up to the legal department. This much I'm sure of right now. Markham's already deposited $100,000 of her insurance money into a joint account. If I'm not mistaken, this last check will go into that account, too. Right now, while we're sitting here, she's probably endorsing that check. Well, then I don't see where it's any of our He's business. making her endorse the check. He's making her stay in that house, in that room, away from everybody. Well, how? What way? He said she was ill. You said she appeared ill. I don't I see I don't it. know how he's doing it, but I'm going to find out. Are you sure this isn't all surmise on your part? You weren't in the room when she said, let's have some sherry, please, let's have some sherry. Well, I, I must be pretty She was dumb, really said. saying, trying to say, she wanted him to leave the room so she could talk to me. So she could have one little minute to tell me what the matter is, what's going on. His next move is to deposit that check. Then one big withdrawal, the whole 150000 and bye-bye Floyd Markham. Mr. Dollar, I'm just an insurance broker. I don't understand that... Well, how'd you like to be an investigator for about ten minutes? Me? Yeah. You see that car that just pulled up in the driveway? Well, yes, yes. The girl driving it holds down that dummy office of Markham's. Her name's Bidler. She might be in on this with him. And that's Mr. Markham leaving the house. Good. Now, look, here's what you do. Follow them. I think I know where they're going, but you follow them and make sure. Well, where are they going? To the bank to deposit that check. Oh. Well, where are you going? To have that glass of sherry, Mr. Porter. Ed Porter pulled his hat down low over his face and put both hands on the wheel and took out after that 55 Cadillac sedan. I crossed the street, went back up on the porch of the house and knocked. I didn't expect her to answer. I didn't expect anyone to answer, but I wanted to make sure. I went around to the garden. There wasn't a sound in the big old house when I opened the garden door and went up the stairs again. The door to her room was closed. She wasn't by the window anymore. She was stretched out on the divan. I felt her wrist for a pulse. It was there, faint, but there. About three inches up her arm, there was a series of little marks. I lifted one eyelid and felt her neck muscles. She was doped to the ears. Mrs. Markham. Mrs. Markham, can you hear me? Look, I've come to help you. Yes. Yes, I'm going to take you out of here. Now, don't be frightened. Mr. Dollar? That's right. That's right. That's the ticket. An insurance company? Yes. Now I remember. Yes, that's right. Thank you for bringing my check. I don't want... Want... Want what, Mrs. Markham? Want any of my friends to worry. Oh. I'm improving... But I don't want them to know I'm ill. Just say I'm out of town for a while. He told you to say that, didn't he? Yes. He told me to say exactly that. Mr. Dollar, don't fool me. Please don't fool me. What? You will help me get out of here. You aren't fooling me, are you? Are you? 
I carried her downstairs and put her in my car and drove her to the St. Regis Emergency Hospital. Expense account item six one hundred dollars deposit with the hospital office. I explained as much as necessary to the intern who promised to advise me when Mrs. Markham became rational. After that, I drove back to the house. Ed Porter's blue coupe was parked across the street. I didn't know what to do but come back here. And when I got back, I didn't know what to do either. Slow down, slow down. You're doing fine. Oh, you were right. You were absolutely right. They went straight to the Bank of America to deposit that money. I kind of thought they might be back here by now. No, no, they're over at Angelo's having a drink and some dinner. I followed them there. You're getting to be quite a sleuth, Mr. Porter. Well, I try to do my best and use my head. Uh, Mr. Dollar, did you talk to Mrs. Mark? As much as I could. She was doped. I took her out and put her in the hospital. Oh. Well, should you have done that, Mr. Dollar? I could have left her up in that room to die, Mr. Porter. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, uh, what's our next move? Ours? Well, certainly. I can't quit now, Mr. Uh, Johnny. (laughs) Well, let's go to Angelo's, Eddie. (laughs) Ed Porter settled the hat lower on his ears and gripped the wheel harder, and we took off for Angelo's on Stoker Street. When we got there, we didn't have to go inside to see if our people were still around. The Cadillac sedan was in the parking lot. So we took up a plant across the street. Why wait? Why not go in and take them out of there and take them down to the police? Well, that might blow the whole thing. Now we have to wait and see what Mrs. Markham has to say when she's well enough to talk. Yeah, but... Uh... I'm sure she'll have some charges to prefer. In the meantime, we wait and see what's what. Yeah, what do you think he'll do when he goes home and finds her gone? <laughs> well, that'll be pretty interesting. What do you think he'll do? Well, I, I imagine he'll, um... Uh, he'll think she got up and walked no, out. No, no, he knows better than that. He's had her doped up for six months. He knows he can go out of the house and she'll stay right where he left her while he's gone. No, that isn't it. Oh. Well, then he'll know that she had help. That's more like it, Mr. Porter. Uh, I, I liked Eddie. It uh, gives me kind of a feeling. Okay, Eddie. Now answer the question. Oh, uh, what'll he do? Well, uh... It's, he'll try to get out of town. That's it. He'll try to leave town. He'll know that he's had it. Come on. Huh? They're pulling out. We followed them to a cocktail lounge near the Presidio. We waited around outside the place for two hours. Expense account item seven twenty-five cents. I called the St. Regis Receiving Hospital. Mrs. Markham's condition was unchanged. Item eight, two dollars, two hamburgers, two Cokes and cigarettes for Mr. Porter and myself. We had just finished eating when Floyd Markham's Cadillac turned out onto the street. We followed it for ten minutes. When Markham parked on a dark hill, we cut our lights and came to a stop. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, Eddie? Can you see what they're doing? Yeah. What? Necking. Huh? Necking, you know. I should have telephoned my wife. At 12.10, Floyd Markham turned the car around and drove back into town. We followed once more. We saw him double park outside a four-story apartment house on a steep hill, let the woman out, then drive on. Eddie? Yeah, Johnny? Think you can handle something else alone? Oh, I'd love to. Women sometimes talk a lot easier than men. You keep on him. When he finds his wife absent, I want to know where he goes. Wherever it is, I'll let you know. You gonna shake her down? Uh, Something like that. Get going. I watched my new assistant investigator follow out after Markham's Cadillac. Then I went inside the apartment house. I, Bidler, was on the mailbox of apartment 104. I walked down the hall, listened a minute, and gave it a try. Yes? Well, what on earth are you doing? I'm here to see you, Miss Bidler. It's important. You're, um, Mr. Harris. I'm Mr. Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, there was something about you today. I I wasn't sure. Now you're sure. Oh, what are you doing? Right now, I'm working for Western Life and Trust Company. You better sit down. Well, I don't know that I'd better do anything, Mr. Dollar. You're rather rude. Then you can stand. We've been checking into Floyd Markham. I don't think I have to tell you what we found out so far. I think you also know that by this time tomorrow, he'll be in jail and you might be right along with him. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I simply oh, don't... don't be under- sorry. Just use your head. I said you might be right along with him. On the other hand, if you have some useful information, the insurance company might be useful to you. What do you mean? 
Well, I figure he sold you on a, an island trip or uh, an estate in the country bill of goods. It'll be hard at getting it out of him, but we'll get it one way or another. We'll get it all right. Now, what do you want to do? I... I want a drink. You? Oh, thanks. I'm... I'm not bad. I'm... I'm not a criminal. I, I've never been in trouble. You are now. Why? Because I fell in love with him? Because you were helping him kill her. What are you talking about? Mrs. Markham. She's in a hospital right now. What? I took her there myself today. He's had a dope with I don't know what for months. Having us sign checks and doors deposit slips. <sighs> Honey. Is it? He told me that Mrs. Markham was out of town. Divorcing him. I wondered how I... You were right. It was a country estate. In England. A genteel life, he said. The London theater. Walks in the country. Little harmless things that most people can never do. He said we could do them as soon as he cleaned up his affairs. By tonight, he said we could start pack... packing... I took Iris Bidler with me back to the Markham house. The Cadillac was in the garage and Ed Porter's blue coupe was pulled up across the street. When he saw us in the cab, he walked up. Hi. Hi. How's he doing? Uh, you can talk in front of her. Well, he, he hasn't done anything. Now, I mean, I saw the light go on upstairs in Mrs. Markham's room, then it went out again. He's downstairs now, sitting in the living room. Okay. Wait here. Uh. Hello. If you're worried about your wife, which I doubt, she's in a hospital. Are you a policeman? Insurance investigator. That's Miss Beidler in the taxi over there. Oh. I want you to come with me now. Of course. Yes. Uh, you said your name was Dollar. That's right. Why couldn't you have come around, say, next week? She'd have been dead by then. That's the way she should have been for 16 years. Dead. Yeah. Come on, Markham. <laughs> Expense account, item 9, $102, hotel and board in San Francisco. Item 10, $116, airfare back to Hartford. Item 11, $42.16, miscellaneous. Remarks? This one will wind up in court. Mrs. Markham's charges will include attempted homicide, attempt to defraud, attempt to... In the end, it was his attempt to run away, and it didn't work. It never works. Even if you get away, you find something new to run from. Total expenses, $968.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Before I do, I want to say something to you about Thanksgiving. Now, there's a day that deserves celebration. And heartfelt thanks to the God who made us for being able to live in the most free and peaceful and bountiful country in the world. And yet, why wait for next Thursday or any Thanksgiving day? For Americans, it seems to me, Thanksgiving should be every day. Think about it, won't you? Next week in our story, New Orleans, the French Quarter, a beautiful girl and high adventure. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. 
Heard in tonight's cast were Lois Corbett, Frank Nelson, Virginia Gregg, Bert Holland, Paula Winslow, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Classic uh, commentary at the end. Uh, in fact, some of the uh, old-time radio sets I've seen out there have actually uh, just uh, included a clip from that uh, for some uh, Thanksgiving sets. So a uh, great and very uh, thought-provoking uh, commentary. Um, also, uh, I love how... Uh, Johnny works through this episode. Really, it's just about knowing your stuff, recognizing signs, and uh, being able to uh, take action, which he does. And I also like the twist of the girlfriend uh, not actually being in on it, which is uh, which is kind of a nice departure from the typical detective uh, radio program. Uh, all right, well, on to some listener comments and feedback. We actually got quite a few comments regarding episode 1411, uh, The Yours Truly Matter. Bobby uh, Lee Walker says, I, I can't believe my uh, buddy Johnny got carjacked twice in the same night. Uh, but he does say that he likes the recurring characters. Uh, Becky says, this is one of my favorites. Christy says, really enjoyed this one. And Elizabeth says, good story. Well, thanks so much. I do appreciate your comments uh, regarding uh, the uh, Yours Truly Matter. And you can become one of our friends on Facebook at facebook.com slash radiodetectives. But that will do it for today. Uh, If you do have a comment, you can uh, mail it uh, to me at uh, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. Or you can 